The house where he was born was different from the one we see today. It was smaller. It was full of life. Inside, there was a tavern. Outside, there was a gristmill teeming with activity. In front of the house were the sacristy and apse of the parish church of St. Michael. Perhaps with this first house in mind, Verdi always used to say, let's go back to the old times and we'll have made some progress. The restoration did not bring the building back to its original form. That would have been impossible. The objective was simply to restore the parts that had remained unchanged. Not being able to remove busts, plaques, commemorative tablets and other funeral relics, the choice was made to limit the restoration to the elimination of electric light and the addition of some pieces of furniture, made today with popular wood in a style analogous to that which presumably was used back then in a tavern wine shop. It was a place that smelled of wine all year round. The old barrels, even if they're not the originals, smell of Manzi. Outside there were no cars or trucks, no luxury buses full of tourists. There was nothing but the countryside. The landscape of Padania, the Po River Valley, framed and cadenced by the rows of poplar trees, marking geometric boundary lines, squaring off fields, running alongside canals and streams. A landscape that was arid in the summer and frozen in the winter, with a hovering fog that hid the horizon for months on end. The storms were and still are exactly like those painted by Giorgione and Guercino. The night was, and still is, even darker and more mysterious, like the night in Il Travatore. A landscape that's both fertile and austere, like the landscape surrounding the villa hunting lodge of the noble Pallavicino family. The last heirs of a duchy of the same name, lost two or three centuries earlier. The Pallavicino family spent their summers in this place they'd built near Busetto. A bizarre construction, frivolous yet solid. Imagine without the smaller villas that now surround it and with its still remaining statues lit up by torchlight or candles. Verdi admired these statues very much. It seems that he never actually entered the villa to visit the Pallavicini, but he did buy for Villa Sant'Agata the statues that the Marquis was forced to sell, as legend has it, to pay his gambling debts. After the villa is restored, it'll become a Verdian monument. Like Busetto and its theater named in his honor, which he so rarely, if ever, visited. He didn't like the idea. He felt that a small village, even a very old one, would never be able to manage a theater. He was wrong. Beyond the name they gave to the theater, the people of Busseto wanted it to reflect not so much the grandeur of the great European theaters that produced the operas of the maestro, but the elegance and refinement that distinguished the Carlo Felice in Genoa, the San Carlo in Naples, and especially the Fenice in Venice. 
The theatre was built inside the Rocca or fortress, that was then redecorated and deprived of its moat. The Rocca was also redesigned along the lines of the Palazzo Ducali in Venice. Later, the theatre's colours became Italian, or Carducci red, as it appears to us today. The restoration of a theatre is the equivalent of the restoration of a musical instrument. When his music returns, Verdi himself, although invisible, returns to this theatre, and it's like returning to the great opera houses of Europe. A return to old times, as it were, and it's a bit of progress for everybody. To restore means to bring back. For the plains along the river valley between Parma and Piacenza, restoration means bringing back the presence of Verdi. For Roncoli, which remained impressed in his memory, and for Sant'Agata, which constitutes an integral part of his operatic production. Restoration means broadening and deepening our knowledge of these places, eliminating the incrustations of the commonplace bringing back, wherever possible, the altered space to its original form and dimension. Sant'Agata embraces Roncoli, both figuratively and literally. Situated to the north of Busseto, it looks like it's polar opposite, and not only geographically. It took Verdi some 30 years to build it. In one of his letters, he wrote, and so I'm the architect, the master mason, the blacksmith, a little of everything. Therefore, farewell to books, to music. I feel as if I've forgotten and never known the musical notes. It wasn't so. Just look at the drawings. The designs are thick with notes invented specially for the villa. They look like pentagrams. The double file of poplars parallel to the Anginer recalls Roncoli. The avenue of plain trees, where he went walking every morning, recalls the villa of the Pallavicini, owners of the tavern where he was born. Here, the luxury of the ice house. There, the grottoes similar to the ones in certain Palladian villas so well known to the Boito brothers. And look at the water of the lake, so much more romantic and mysterious than the geometric canals surrounding the little castle, envied by the vile courtiers. The superb kitchen. One wonders how it compares to the kitchen on the Pallavicini. The overall plan appears to be analogous to Villa Paradiso. And its final expansion and completion of the two symmetrical bastion terraces give it a resemblance to the summer house of the former owners of the tavern in Roncoli. But Verdi's visual sense, his architectural conception, look beyond the Alps. Observe the English garden. The furniture and the carpets purchased in Paris. The 
the villa welcomed a steady stream of visitors. The guests were housed on the first floor above ground level, on the piano nobile. Verdi, his piano, and his wife, Giuseppina Strepponi, lived on the ground floor, in direct contact with the park that was, at the same time, both stage and barrier. It's been said that at Sant'Agata, Verdi spoke little or not at all of his operas. He preferred to exhibit his achievements as a gardener, farmer, or simple bricklayer, Magut. He was always composing at Sant'Agata, even when he was planning a trip, especially when he was working on building the house and the park. Architect and manual labor, Magut precisely. The task of maintaining the house of his lifetime, Villa Verdi at Sant'Agata, is not an easy one, and not only because of the high costs involved. The carriages must live together with modern automobiles. The copper casseroles with the refrigerator. The trees suffer. In the absence of the maestro, they fell abandoned. Restoration attempts to bring back the specific characteristics of the place. Never so much as in this case as going back to the old times represented such authentic progress. Purified of the incrustations of the commonplace and of the banal rhetoric of funereal commemoration, these places are able to represent not only the specific characteristics of the setting where Verdi was born and lived his long life, but also the cultural identity of a land in which history is tied to labor and nature to art. The native house was visible and had overlooked the road, while his villa was secluded and almost hidden, mysterious looking beyond the wall and greenery of the garden. A wooden bridge, which had been rebuilt many times over, led to the house. Beyond the bridge, a gate allowed you to glimpse at the entrance of the villa. The bridge was situated at the beginning of a symmetric axis that crossed the house, the inner courtyard and outside properties, and ended in a small island in the middle of a lake. Verdi spent over 30 years building this villa and its symbolic garden. In early years, it must not have been easy nor very comfortable to live in Sant'Agata. There were only three or four rooms. It was a small farmhouse with a hayloft, a hovel. Thereafter, the villa was expanded and it became the pivot and the heart of a big property. It became the lifelong house of the maestro. The metric survey of the house gave way to the use of architectural installations and styles that were very far from refined. The survey of the garden may also have hidden a mysterious design. The garden already existed when the house was expanded. If you try analyzing the construction of the house, you will identify not only the supporting axes, but also, and more importantly, a precise anthropomorphic cosmology. His garden could be a symbol in Verdi's life, representing his philosophical interpretation of the universe. There are many pictures that explain the similarities between the parts of the body and the constellations. The capitals of the Cluny cloisters often narrate cosmologies which are said to be places where stones sing. The course of human life, which is in touch with this cosmic scenery reflected on Earth by similar images, and which moves according to the course of the sun, starts in this muddy area, liquid. The entrance of Villa Verdi is situated on the banks of Ongine. Verdi's zodiac sign is Libra. The foliage of the tree of the world is in Cancer, where the Magna Mater and the tree of life are. 
The roots of the tree of life reach the center of the maestro's room. The lake is situated on the side where a man's life declines. When a man has reached maturity, he leaves the mountainside and heads towards the valley. The garden, like the villa, isn't coincidentally similar to the construction of other gardens. It looks like an English garden surrounding an aristocratic 19th century villa. Most of all, it's his villa and his garden. They represent his life from beginning to end. The Angina can be compared to the Roncole Canal. It's situated in the east where the sun rises. The lake is situated in front of the big property and its position enables Verdi to express his art peacefully. The sun sets in the west. <laughs>